Anyway, uh, it's nice to be here. We've got some interesting developments that have happened, and that's uh, this screen that we've got up here of this wave. One of the machinery, uh, piece of machinery that I'm operating in on uh, the table in there is a weapons development spectrum analyzer. And what the what it's used for, it's about a $60,000 machine that was developed, developed by Tektronix. And it, uh, what it does is it uh, enables uh, the aerospace and military to develop weapons-grade electronic attack systems. And one of the things that it does is that when you have a weapons, electronic weapon attack, this machine locks onto it and, they, and captures that wave. Uh, the application is that if, you, if, we're if we're flying a jet or some kind of military mission and we get ground radar hitting the aircraft, this kind of machinery will then assess the radar and then uh, select a countermeasure to fire back to the ground so that the individual looking on the radar set will see 15 or 20 blips instead of the one aircraft that we're in. So the application on this machine is that it was uh, for making electronic warfare uh, uh, aggressive equipment and also defensive equipment. Now, what we're looking at here and the development that's taken place, and I've seen this before, is that yesterday some government entity was taking a satellite and, and uh, sending down brain interfering signals. In other words, the whole hotel area, both this area and the other side, was saturated. And what this machine did is it captured that attack wave. The way, uh, I turned the machine on about 8.30 in the morning and it was there. Now, for the past five days, I've been in Sunnyvale doing an assignment over there and this wave was not present the whole five days that I did analysis of the electromagnetic spectrum over there. And so this kind of wave would have the effect to make people nauseated, headaches, uh, you feel lethargic, you would feel anxiety. You would uh, not be in a very good mood. You'd be edgy. You would um, your your body would be telling you it's time to go somewhere else because this place doesn't feel good. Now this morning, when we turn the system back on again and make another analysis, that wave is is gone. So either the satellite that they had in position to 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 uh, expose us to this has moved, or they decided that they just wanted to give us a one solid day dose of it. It did shut down. Uh, last night just before the uh, banquet and so we we were all we had a good solid eight ten hours of exposure to this thing now I don't know how many people have been here both days that noticed that today they're feeling a whole lot better than they did yesterday and I've talked to quite a few people uh, and asked them whether they feel better and whether they felt anything yesterday and I've, there's been quite a few people that have said that they're feeling a whole lot better today than yesterday you're, uh, how many people feel better today than yesterday? Quite a few. Yeah, see? So this stuff is, is the real deal, and the interesting thing about a convention like this is that they're concerned enough about us talking about these matters and all the other related subject matters that uh, your First Amendment rights are in position, but that doesn't mean they're not going to send some kind of attack wave down there to try to discourage the meeting, and that's what happened. I'm going to go ahead and animate this uh, thing so you can see what the actual thing looks like. This is a video that we, we, we took of the uh, attack wave in and of itself. And what's going to happen when I initiate it here is you'll get to see exactly how this thing works when you see it real time. It's a frequency hopping wave. And you see how it's jumping all over the spectrum. It's going back and forth. These are uh, short videos, but uh, this gives you the, the dynamics of what happens with this thing. And these waves are pulsed microwaves, so they're, they're not only just covering one area, they're sweeping back and forth, and they are causing interference to the brain because the brain is basically also a computer that uses synapse firings to, for all your thoughts and body control. I'm going to run this one one more time, and I'm going to show you a, diff a different view of it because I changed the uh, settings on the, uh, on the uh, machine in terms of trying to make further analysis. This one is the, is the most real-time analysis, and that's why the wave looks like it's going e even faster. The next one I'll show you, this machine has different kind of uh, capabilities to make analysis, and so, this is not my computer here, so I'm going to be a little slow on it. Let's close that out. Uh, it is 1.7 gig, almost 2 gigahertz. 
The numbers that are on the bottom left right here is the band center, this 1.775 gigahertz. Now, in this case, I'm using what's known as a marker, and that's going to be this little blip right here you see. Once I animate it, what the blip does, this is what's known as sig track, so it's going to jump around, even though the actual wave that they fired at us is jumping around, the sig track is going to follow it, and you can see that here, that little V that's on the top. And what that does is it, it will moves with the signal as the signal jumps, and as a consequence, you can see up in the top up here, we're getting a chance to look at the actual power levels. The number that's, that's rotating in the, in the upper right corner says minus 50, 50, 40. It's, what it's doing is, is summating those different power levels that are being fired at. Now, the actual level of this thing, it, this, in terms of its power right now, or when we captured it, it's running about two times the power of an FM radio station. Now, if you think about an FM radio station, normally they're 35, they can be anywhere from 35 million watts to somewhere in the range of 50, 50 megawatts. So for a signal to come up to these levels where you're roughly twice the, your, your ambient FM station means that we're dealing with a fair amount of power coming out of the sky. The, uh, get this thing to run one more time, then we'll move on to the last one. The uh, numbers in the top left is the actual frequency that it's hopping to. It's 1.771, 776. So this is what was being radiated down on all of us from above yesterday all day long. And now that I've told you about it, you can maybe think back also on maybe something, some things you were feeling yesterday that just weren't quite right. And what would be, uh, because we are ar archiving this attack and, you know, it's interesting. You don't often get a chance to capture these attacks. Usually they're not so brazen that, uh, that they're going to want you to see exactly what kind of technology they're using on, it, on you. So I've only had maybe 10 attacks or so that I've been able to document like this. One of the other ones was the uh, mind control meeting up in, um, in Davis, which was a few years ago with Mary Ann Stratton. I was running machinery up there also, and then we got the same kind of similar kind of attack, and everybody was feeling bad. That particular meeting was in a church that was out in the uh, farm area, a little bit south of Davis. So I went out there with my binoculars to see if I could see any vans or any kind of cell towers or any kind of other sources that could have caused that wave, but uh, there was nothing around. It was, once again, coming straight out of a satellite. And in, uh, in my information here, we'll have a look at what some of those satellites look like as we move towards some of the other systems. But this is a really a special thing to be able to capture one of these things. Now, here's the uh, last animation on, on, uh, on this thing. And what I did on this one is I made the, band the bandwidth wider so we're able to see it jump over a wider range. It doesn't stay at one frequency, and that's one of the reasons that it's so uh, efficient at causing uh, brain interference is because, you know, it's not just going to resonate one particular speed and one particular frequency. It's moving and jumping, and the overall motion in and of itself has a frequency to it. So this is, this is the real deal satellite-type electromagnetic brain interference type of uh, situation. And if you want to see anything further on it, the actual machine that I captured it on is running in the other room on the table. And also we have these QuickTime videos, that, uh, the, the video presentations themselves uh, over in the other room as well. So, okay, that's the big news. You've gotten, you got hit directly. If you've been here yesterday and today, you've had the first, first-hand exposure to what some of these things can do. And of course, what the intent is on developing these weapons is that, you know, we're not going to shoot people with metal bullets anymore. The whole idea is to be able to go to the battlefield and turn on weapons of, the, of this nature and jam people's ability to oppose you just because you can cause their thinking and their bodies to be so sick and so overwhelmed and so confused that they will no longer be able to fight. And the, and the nice thing about that is that you don't have to blow up the cities, you don't have to blow up the bridges, you don't have to blow up the infrastructure like we, we did in Iraq and then have to go spend billions of dollars to fix it. You just jam the people that you want to jam and that's the outcome. 
Okay, so let me move on. You know, I've, I've done about uh, eight or seven or eight Coast to Coast shows, and I'm, hopefully you've heard some of them. And uh, you can go ahead and switch the video over anytime you're ready. And what, uh, what I'm able to talk about here is a little bit more flexible than I've been able to talk on the, um, on the Coast to Coast show. Now, George said last night that, uh, that Coast to Coast is pretty free about allowing you to speak about things. But I have to tell you and be honest with you that I did a Coast to Coast show, and it was probably two or three back. And before I, and it was during the Bush administration. And before I was allowed on the air, I was told that do not send, say anything against George Bush personally. They said uh, fine to, to uh, talk about the policies and any of the, uh, the uh, things that they have done, uh, you know, in terms of the, the uh, war and the other, um, other travesties that they did relating to our, our civil rights. But they, you know, they said to me, just don't uh, say anything personal about George Bush. So, you know, there was fear in their hearts. And, of course, uh, I did a, a radio show with Art Bell where we spent a good two hours butting heads about privacy. And uh, he was defending the government. And uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the details of that show. I don't know if, if you were able to hear that show. But it was I had a lot of people email me and said, boy, who got to Art Bell that he's out there defending uh, the, the abuse of the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and the Sixth Amendment? So we'll, we'll talk about that. Anyway, be, that we're here. I have a little more flexibility to talk a little more politico. And, you know, after listening to the, some of the other speakers, I'd like to make a couple of comments because uh, basically I've stud, studied sovereignty and law for, for six years. And I've, uh, I've sued the government personally uh, three times. I've filed habeas corpuses. I've got a larger constitutional law library in my home than they've got in Riverside County, California. Now... Thank you very much. And the really good news is, is that you can go on eBay and you can type in constitutional law book, law books, and you will have access to buying sixty hundred dollar law books for fifteen dollars, and you can do it yourself. It took me a lot of years to get the particular books I wanted, but that's how easy it is. These kids that study law for a while, they turn in these uh, educational books and. Uh, um, you really can, can, can get some terrific information that you can have on hand. However, let me just move back a little bit. Now, before George Bush got into office, we all know that Bush Sr. made this speech about the New World Order. And uh, it was an eye-opener for everybody because basically what he said, you know, is that we're just going to let the corporations run the world and we're all going to be happy ever after. And then when George Jr. got in, I wish I could be there to see it, but here's what I, the way I think the conversation went. George Sr. said to George Jr., you've got three objective, uh, objectives. I want you to dismantle, disrupt the United States military. I want you to dismantle and disrupt the United States Constitution. I want you to dismantle and disrupt the United States economy. Well, everybody thinks this kid's an idiot, but guess what? Mission accomplished in eight years. Mission accomplished. He's got all three objectives. He wore our military out on a, on a war that was unnecessary. Billions and billions of dollars spent, and that is even the, the cost of human life, and not only our kids fighting over there, but all the people that they massacred uh, in that location as well. And none of it connected to 9-11. And then, of course, they let the, uh, they let the, uh, the uh, Wall Street people run free didn't do anything, as the lecturer uh, the other morning was talking about. They did nothing to allow uh, on these derivatives. They let it all go crazy. And now people, hard-working people, their 401ks are down 60 percent, the saving their life savings. And then the, uh, this Patriot Act, which is a, an abomination. The Patriot Act has attempted to destroy the First Amendment, so free, uh, free speech, especially with national security letters. The Fourth Amendment for warrants necessary any time you're going to search somebody's uh, home, especially uh, now sneak and peek warrants where they can go break into your location, they can copy your hard drive, they can take and, and uh, photograph your papers, and then just leave the premises and never tell you that they were there for an extended period of time. The Sixth Amendment, to be able to just throw people in jail indefinitely without bringing them before a trial. 
before a, a, a court to be able to torture people. You know, the other day when I saw Cheney on Fox News talk about torturing people, and I'm a very big fan of 1984, the book, and if we were having a course here, I would make everybody mandatory read 1984. But anyway, Big Brother, that was in, the, in everybody's home on this big telescreen, and of course a camera to watch you as well. You know, Big Brother was on there all the time with propaganda, and I, I looked at George Shaney uh, uh, talking about torturing people, and you know, I got this feeling that I, deja vu, that this is what exactly Big Brother looked like when he was talking out of that telescreen. It gave me the exact, a guy that's going to sit there and tell you that I can torture people. And it's okay. Well, the Founding Fathers, <laughs> you know, the Founding Fathers would have nothing to do with this. I'm sure of it. They were extremely against quartering troops and doing other kinds of uh, uh, negativity on, on a, uh, on a uh, military basis like that. I think personally that before you would think about waterboarding anybody, I personally would like to see anybody that orders that to go through 80 waterboardings themselves. If you can pass through 80 waterboardings and still waterboard somebody else, then uh, you know maybe that's the qualifier that you need for people to say torture is okay. I don't know. Anyway, um, I also want to talk about a status of rights because, you know, we've got this terrible Patriot Act. They snuck it in. It's a horrible thing all the way around. But let me just talk about some of the stuff that you may not have seen. Now, we all know the Federal Reserve was given this private banking cartel back in 1913. There is another document that was passed by Congress in about that same time, and I thought I had it on my computer with me here, but I don't. During that period, same period of time, Congress passed a declaration, now get ready, that all property in, in America belongs to the states. That all property belongs to the states. Now, as a consequence, if you are a homeowner, let's say that you don't have uh, a bank loan, that you have a free and clear property, well, the actual legal status is, is that you're an equitable lien holder. You have a lien against that property. You don't own the property because the state owns the property. Further, the state and your local counties have taken that property and they put that property up for the surety for all the bond issues and the loans for the schools, the, um, uh, the uh, infrastructure, sewers and water systems. Just like the United States is up to its neck in debt, all the counties for all these bond issues that everybody said, oh yeah, let's, you know, they, I mean, they put it before the voters and the voters said, yeah, but you know, you've got billions and billions and billions in loans for these things and your property is the surety for those loans. So give this a thought for a minute. Let's say that China, who's holding $4 trillion of our borrowings, let's say things get worse and we start borrowing more and we start borrowing more. One of these days a Chinese banker could show up at the, at the front, your front door and say, guess what? Your county is defaulted on this loan on this property and now I am going to put the higher lien than your value to recover this surety that you, that you allowed and you no longer live here. So think about that for a second because, you know, it isn't going to always take bombs, missiles, in, uh, invading troops running up the shores of, of, uh, of California to take over California. You can become a debtor to the extent that you could lose the property that you think you own, but once again, you're an equitable lien holder, and also you know, the IRS does the same thing. When they decide that all of a sudden you owe $500,000 against your property, they can come in and put a higher loan and bump you out, a higher lien, and bump you out of first position. So once again, you don't pay your property taxes. What happens? The property is removed from your possession. You're no longer the lien holder on it. So we don't own property anymore in America. The Founding Fathers, one of the things they came here for was to make sure that you can own property. But unless you have an alloidal title or a land patent, you are nothing more than a lead holder on the property. Bad news. Did it, how many people knew that one? 
Okay. All right. Well, that's the problem. You know, if you don't pay the taxes, the next thing you know, you're out, you're out the door. And this has nothing to do with even the loan on the house. I'm talking about a free and clear property. You don't own it if it can be removed from your possession. Okay. Next thing I want to talk to you about, automobiles. You have an automobile out in the parking lot. Automobile has a California license plate. Let's say that the, that the automobile is fully paid for. So you sit here, you think, well, I own the automobile. Guess what? You have the certificate of title. The state of California has the title. You are driving the state of California's automobile. And the state of California says if you want to drive our automobile, you have to insure the automobile. You have to make sure that you follow all the rules of the road, and you also have to accept all the penalties that come with it. And you have to realize that if you do something like drunk driving, we're going to take our car back. There's even states where if you go solicit a prostitute, they'll sell the car. So you're an equitable lien holder. You know, you can transfer the car on a lien basis to another equitable lien holder, but you are driving the state of California's vehicle. Federal Reserve notes in your pocket. Who do they belong to? Federal Reserve. So if you're driving down the road and you have $15,000 in Federal Reserve notes sitting on the seat and a police officer pulls you over and he sees the, this, uh, these documents, he will pull them and give them to the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve says, well, prove that they're yours. Let's see some kind of bank, bank transaction record to show us that you should be in lawful possession. So. Federal Reserve notes are non-interest bearing debt notes, so they're not money because when on a constitutional basis, money is gold and silver. So here you go. You don't own your home, you're a lien holder. You don't own your car, you're a lien holder. You have temporary use of Federal Reserve notes. In the theory, they're, when they're in a pocket, you have the equitable use and you're, you have a lien on that, on that as well. So what do you own? Gold and silver. That's it. Gold and silver. Now, in 2003, 2004, I went on the George Norrie show, and I think it was the second one, and I told George, because they put the Lear Financial on there, I told George, I said, George, I just sold all my stocks, all my bonds, all my investments, and I bought gold bullion. And I would recommend, because the Lear commercial had just run, I would recommend that all your listeners do the same thing. I was that sure of it, because... I, I watched the markets, and I, uh, I used to be an S&P trader, and I, things started to look really bad to me. So I went out, and I bought all this gold. And I went and doubled my wealth by doing nothing other than allowing the United States government to mismanage itself. I bought the, uh, most of the gold at 420, and I think it's closing it's closed around 960 or 970 today. And it's, and it's going to take off from there. My expectation is it's going higher because, you know, you keep printing paper, these Federal Reserve notes, you know, non-interest bearing debt notes, and people tend to think that they're money, but think about it. If gold and silver constitutionally are, defi are defined as real value wealth, then everything under the zero line is debt. So that if you do some work for me and I uh, owe you a hundred dollars, I give you a $100 United States Federal Reserve note, then I'm, I'm discharging your debt with a debt note. So we're awash in debt. These are all IOUs that we're swapping back and forth. And as long as we all think that the emperor's got clothes, then they're worth something. But the problem is, and I've got the chart here to look at, that when you look at the chart, that shows the buying power of the Federal Reserve note since 1920, it's lost 94% of its buying power. So this is, if this was a gas tank and we were out in 94% of the gas, we'd be down to 6%. We're not going all that much further. Think about that for a second. And you know, I've heard the stories in Germany about how when their paper currency crashed, that it took a uh, wheelbarrow of paper money to go buy a loaf of bread. And I was thinking, wow, is that really true? Well, I met a 95-year-old lady from Germany 
about six months ago, and I asked her the question. She says, it was true. That's exactly what happened. So I just want you know, this, the whole idea of, of this kind of uh, gathering is to try to gain truth and awareness. And I can only tell you that when I have my assets in gold, and the gold is buried underground, it's not in uh, safety deposit boxes because when the banks crashed in 29, they put the chains in the doors of these buildings. All the boxes were looted. Most of the boxes. Never, people never saw what they had. So, you know, uh, underground the earth, in the Earth Mother is the way uh, I think people should go with it. And uh, there are different techniques that you use to make sure that if you were to pass away that other people have some idea where to, where to get, you know, your heirs would, would get it. But I can tell you what it's done for me is I can put my head on my pillow at night and I can go to sleep. But if I was sitting with my assets in Federal Reserve notes, and of course most of the 401k people already have been already thrown to the mat for 50% of what they had, the rate in which they are printing this paper, they say they're 11 thousand billion in debt now, I like to phrase it that way, a trillion to me is, can't even grasp it, 11,000 billion in debt, but if you add Social Security and the Medicare obligations, they're 50,000 billion in debt. It's a number that's unsustainable. Now it's uns unsustainable. And for some reason, you know, I was hoping Obama would be a smart kid. He seems like an intelligent kid. But, you know, how do you spend your way out of indebtedness? I don't I don't understand it. How do you spend your way out of indebtedness? And of course, bailing out Wall Street, the banks, and the rest of these people that have created the problem, there's no justice in that either. So I'm, I'm sure everybody here is pretty in, in agreement on that. <laughs> I don't think many of us like to see what assets are left just get squandered away. Anyway, I just wanted to make some political commentary. Now, the bad news for me up here is that uh, I'm, I'm flying this. Uh, this lecture aircraft, and I've got two of the engines burnt out because I had asked that the uh, um, people, the technical people here, come up with a projection system for me that would project printed matter. I, because m my situation is that technology changes so quickly that almost all my archives on things are printed. And as a consequence, for some reason, there was a uh, cross connection, and they were unable to get the projector to do the work that I wanted done. So what's going to hap happen here is, I've, luckily, most of the, the presentation I've got here, you know, I'm going to be like a sixth grader, and it's going to be show and tell. Uh, I do have the assistance of the screen here, so we're going to have a little amplification factor. But most of the paperwork and discussions I'm going to have here is information that's on the Internet. Some of it's on my website, and some of it's on other people's websites. And I can give you the uh, keywords to Google uh, to get any of this information that you want to pull up on your own. Okay, let me move on here. First of all, my background is, is that I've been a bug sweeper for almost 40 years now. I've been in electronics for a, a really long time. I got my first high voltage electronic shock that threw me to the ground when I was 12. I grabbed onto a high voltage tube and, uh, you know, maybe it helped. It might have given me the little brain boost I needed at the time. I don't know, but anyway, somewhere around uh, 1968 or so, I started to move into this special kinds of investigations. And um, I have an interesting group of people that I worked for. I was sitting here just trying to make a list. Over the years, some of the people that, were, that wanted the services of having their telephone lines secured and their locations swept for bugs and to, to make sure that they had their security were billionaires, Pornographers, gangsters, perverts, murderers, smugglers, gun runners, psychics, UFO contactees, crooked lawyers, crooked doctors, bookies, stock market traders, S&M &S clubs, prostitutes and madams, varieties of swindlers and boiler room operations, real estate moguls, weapons manufacturers, cults and cult victims, culty programmers, movie stars, producers, music stars, casinos. That's just what I rattle off just to, 
to get some feel for. Uh, now it's been a, a great journey because you know these people are really fun. I mean, what? You, you can't ask for more entertainment than some of these crazy people. And of course, uh, uh, the billionaires were terrific. I started doing the work for Howard Hughes back in 1968. I, I put together his sound system that rocked the whole ninth floor there at the Desert Inn and because uh, he, wa he wanted to watch movies. You know, he had owned RKO and he wanted the, the local, he bought the local TV station because he wanted to see movies, but that wasn't good enough. So they put him up in the penthouse and we put this gigantic sound system in there. It was a, a voice of the theater speakers, the big speakers from, from movie theaters, and he just rocked, he rocked the chandeliers in the place. That whole story is on my website at bugsweeps.com. The uh, pictures and other information uh, about the, the Howard Hughes thing, because that was one of the first billionaires. I uh, had several other billionaires. Uh, Merv, Merv was one of my billionaire clients, and uh, other uh, individuals that were um, billionaires from uh, land transactions. There are some there are some homes that I have been in in Bel Air with people that were executives for the oil companies where the whole interior of the of these mansions were Greek and Roman things. I mean, it was like stepping back 2,000 years. They, everything was from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. It's amazing to see how some of the people live that have these fantastic fortunes. Unbelievable. And then uh, I did a lot of mafia work also in uh, Las Vegas back when the Italian mafia was running it. And when that's when Vegas was great. I mean, they took up the tables, but the food was free and the shows were free and the drinks were free and everything was free. And it just was a, it was a really wild place back then. And I uh, got a chance to hang out with uh, um, Frank and some of the boys and Elvis and some of the other great stars of that time. And... Uh, Las Vegas was, you know, I don't even, I pass through it now. I don't even stay, stay there anymore. It's just, to me, it's just a shell of what it used to be. And, uh, and also, I used to sweep um, and some of the interesting things in, in, uh, in, in Hollywood was that there was, a, there was a card club hidden. It was a secret card club hidden under a nightclub on Sunset Boulevard. And this is during the 1980s. And three times a month I'd go there, and it was, you know, gambling tables and all that. And three times a month I would go there and sweep this location. And then that evening, the Italian mafia, the black mafia, the Cuban mafia, the Russian mafia, and any other guest mafias that they had would all merge on this building. And they would gamble with one another, big stakes gambling, and they would make handshake deals because all the cocaine was at that time coming in uh, from uh, the CIA into Los Angeles. And these people had this distribution network and they did everything by handshakes and suitcases of money going back and forth. And there was times where we were bodyguarding some of these people just because they were pretty, some of them were pretty looney tune. They would, you know, catalog, carried a lot of guns and a lot of people like to just shoot guns and, you know, just for fun, just go out there and unload uh, a, uh, a uh, automatic. <laughs> and a lot of them carried over 100,000 cash. I remember I had one, we were riding a limo with one Cuban uh, mafia guy and he said, I want to go to this place that has the Cuban coffee. So we're down at Southgate. And we go to this uh, Cuban coffee stand, and uh, he orders Cuban coffee for everybody. There's about four or five of us. And he takes out $100,000 out of his pocket. He had a roll this thick, $100,000. And people that were standing there went like, whoa. They'd never seen so much money. Big rubber bands, a big circular thing like that. And I said, put the money away. Put the money away. And, uh, you know, we took the money out and paid for the drinks. I mean, only, <laughs> only five, six bucks for the whole thing. But, you know, they also sent me down to, I remember one other little thing I'm going to tell you here. They sent me down to Southgate. And uh, it's a little rundown, little dumpy place in Southgate. I can't figure out why they want me to go down there and do a bug sweep on a d dumpy little place like this, you know. So I knock on the door, and the guy that opens up is one of the, their bodyguards from uh, Columbia. And he's sitting there with an with a, uh, AK-47 on his lap. 
And I said, well, why would the boss send me down? He said, well, I'll just sweep the place out. Check it out. Okay, so I took the, the sweep gear out. And I'm sweeping the walls and the floor with the gear that we've got to do that. And then there's a bedroom area in the back. I said, well, do you want me to sweep the bedroom? He said, yeah, go in there and sweep the bedroom. So I go in the bedroom, and here is boxes of cash, boxes and boxes of boxes of cash, all 20s and, and rubber bands, all different color rubber bands. And I, I walk back out to this guy. I said, well, how much money's in there? He said, oh, 750 maybe a million. And I said, huh, tell you what, I'll go in there and sweep it, but you better sit right there with me because I don't want anybody to think that I did any samples, you know. <laughs> So it was, uh, it was, I was younger and stupider, and it was a lot of danger to some of it. But then again, uh, I had a lot of good times, too. I was with, uh, I was with um, um, Rock Hudson the night he died at his house. And uh, that was uh, something to see because, of course, he was one of the first famous AIDS people. And uh, I got a chance to spend a lot of time with some very big stars and some really terrific people in Hollywood. And, you know, they weren't all crazy perverts and all that. But, you know, a lot of the, the excitement is the, is the crazy gun stuff. I remember we were bodyguarding one place in Bel Air because uh, one guy, they had attempt, made an attempt on his life. And we were sitting out there in the backyard at 2 o'clock in the morning with, with, with two machine guns. And the sprinkler system went on, and we, we machine gunned all the sprinklers. <laughs> no, we thought we were being attacked. You know how sprinklers are. They all pop up there, so we're out there. <laughs> Police came. It wasn't fun. Okay, uh, let's move on to one more privacy thing. I had mentioned that Art Bell and myself had had this headbutting session where I had listed and talked to him about things that he thought would be okay with him to allow the government to look into. And of course, keep in mind with national security letters that are part of the Patriot Act now, you don't even have warrants for these government people to come in and look at these categories of privacy uh, kinds of uh, accounts. And so, you know, we got to get rid of the Patriot Act. That's the bottom line. We've got to get rid of it. <laughs> We have to somehow get us get a court that's going to have the understanding of the founding fathers to not allow these kind of gross abuses of these bill of, bill of right amendments. But I just want to go through this list of things that you need to think about that the government can just walk with a letter and say, "Here, give me their information." So I just want to run down the list so that you can think about it and see where you're at with it. The first would be, obviously, bank account statements. Everybody's got a bank account. Well, security agents of Homeland Security, FBI, CIA, they can just now take a national security letter and then go into a bank and say, here, give me all his bank statements. So right there, everything that's gone through your bank, and that would include credit card purchase statements. One of the things that drives me crazy is, is, is if you watch Law and Order, half the time when they're solving a case, the, the cop walks into the other cop, he says, well, his credit card statements are coming through the facts as we speak. And of course, a lot of times they are using credit cards to place people at different locations in different times. Because if you're running your card, then that leaves this trail of not only what you buy, but when you bought it, and at what time. Stock market and stu uh, mutual fund statements. These are where your assets are, say your saving assets are located. IRS tax filing records. There's a real road map of where your assets are, what you make, who you work for, and obviously if you're taking deductions, wh what you spend it on. Credit reporting agency information. You know, th these, these government agents could just run your credit reports, and then they get this whole litany and list of where your assets are and how you spend things and where to go give the rest of the national security letters to get the, the, the other information. Landline and cell phone telephone bills. Well, this is, this is really a problem because, you know, recently the courts have told Everybody that complained about the NSA getting all the dialed number information, they, during this court lawsuit, came up and said, well, the dial information that the phone companies have in their records belongs to the phone company. Well, wait a second. I 
called people I wanted to call. My expectation was that who I call is my business. Well, guess what? That's not the case. Courts say, oh, yeah, you want to just take that whole database of three years or so, they keep the dial numbers for about three years, and just send it to a supercomputer in NASA headquarters, and they'll do what they call data mining, where they start connecting all these phone numbers up to one another, 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 making these gigantic network of information. So now they know who you talk to for the past three years. Gasoline credit card statements, every place you go, within the 200 mile, 300 mile increment of buying another another gasoline uh, tank, tank of gas. They know the timeline, they know where you were, they know approximately how much gas you had, how far you, how far you could have gone. Cell phone tracking location records, and there's been a lot of controversy about this. Now this is the way it works. When you have a cell phone and you go from point A to point B and you switch from one tower location to another because the way cell towers are set up, and I've got some pictures here so you can get a good, good idea how the setup works. When you go from one cell tower to the next, there's a handoff that's involved. In other words, your cell phone does a handshake going from the tower that you're linked to to the tower that you're going to link to. It says, I'm over here, and then there's an exchange of information so that when somebody calls into the system looking for you, the system knows approximately which tower to send the call through. Now that handshake information goes into the database of the cell company. Once again, this is database information that the NSA has now full access to so they know everywhere that your cell phone has been when it's on for the past three years. How does that make you feel? Easy pass statements. In other words, when you use the easy pass, that's the microwave RFID that's in your automobile so that when you go on those parts of the freeway, they know how to charge you for your uh, use of that freeway, whatever the rate is. But that doesn't mean that those reader systems aren't working in other places because once the RFID is in the window, any RFID reader that's near the freeway will read your presence. So a lot of people have gotten into trouble for that. They said, oh, I wasn't there, but then the RFID system says, yeah, you were. You got a charge during that time, and that's another tracking. Medical records. Well, this is the big push with these people. Let's get all the medical records on database. And that's what we're hearing right now, that we're working real hard on it. The uh, Obama administration wants everybody's medical records on, uh, on databases now. Well, you can see where that's going. Databases mean that you can move the huge amount of information around, and next thing you know, the NSA is going to say, you know what? Here's a national security letter for that person. Send me over all the data. I want to know all about their health condition. Databases are scary because, you know, as these microchips and as these ba databases get more powerful and more powerful, your privacy gets smaller and smaller. It's an, it's an inverse function. The more powerful the, the processing processing chip and the processing systems, the smaller your privacy. Criminal records. Oh, one more thing on the medical records. A sample of your DNA. A sample of your DNA. You get arrested in California, they take a sample of your DNA. That means that you're in that database for whatever use that they plan. Good at birth now. At birth, is that right? Well, pff, wouldn't surprise me. Well, wouldn't surprise me. Okay, uh, criminal records, arrest records. Military records, driver's license records, satellite surveillance. Now these satellite surveillance systems that they have can go back and look at what's happened for the past couple of weeks. So if there was one of their surveillance satellites traveling in your general area, they would be able to go back and see not only what's visible on the ground, but these satellites have radar in them. They are able to look through the roofs and they're able to see who 
what bodies are in what locations. This originally was settled because they were flying aircraft around looking for people growing marijuana in the inside of the homes. And so there was a court argument about, well, you busted this guy because you were using infrared uh, equipment to look through the actual home itself, which should be Fourth Amendment protected. So they went back and forth on that, and I don't, I don't really think that they're still clear about it, but I know that the surveillance radar satellites have the capability of looking straight through your roofs to at least to determine how many people are there, and of course they probably can determine other structures that are inside your home as well. Now, uh, the NSA partnered with Microsoft on the, develop, on the security portions of the VISTA system. How does that make you feel? Backdoor city, that's what it's about. They'll be able to just go straight into the back of your computer and take out whatever they want and never even have to enter your location. The other thing people are concerned about is the Manchurian microchip. What the Manchurian microchip is is that all the, all the computer motherboards come from China. And unless anybody really knows how to totally analyze every chip and every architect tech texture of a motherboard, how do we know that the Chinese aren't in position to turn every computer off permanently if there was hostilities between us and them? Think about that for a second. A backdoor switch, a Manchurian, a Manchurian microchip to, during a period of hostilities to permanently shut off every computer that they've made and all the computers come from that part of the world. Do you think that would turn things up and down pretty, uh, upside down pretty quick? That's almost the, y, the, the Y2K that we were sweating years ago, except it would all really go down on an overnight basis. Cable TV program charges. So every time you go on your cable TV and you order something special, they get a chance to look at those records as well. And of course, now that we've all gone digital, part of what that's all about is we're getting ready for the Big Brother telescreen. Back in the 1984 novel, Winston would have to be in his living room and the Big Brother would be on pro telling him the propaganda of the day. And there was a, a camera in the screen. And the camera would be watching at all times. So you would never know when you were really being watched. And Winston says, that because that's going on, you can never show any emotion. Your face has to stay motion, uh, emotionless, in which case Big Brother wouldn't have a chance to assess whether you were disagreeing with the propaganda that was coming across the screen. And I only have to tell you now, relating to that, that uh, you, know, you go to Las Vegas and you walk through the door of any major hotel, your face is scanned and it's sent to a database and you're compared instantly to all the cheats that they know of in their database. So facial recognition is, real, is the real deal. So anyway, getting back to the, uh, this digital TV switch is happening probably today or tomorrow. We're going over to digital, and the idea on the digital is that you're going to be able to do a lot more flexibility relating to two-way communication. Now, I pulled a couple of boxes apart so far that I've gotten a chance to look at. I'm looking for cameras, and I'm looking for microphones, and they're not there yet, at least not in these very first units. But it wouldn't surprise me pretty soon, just like you have on standard equipment on a PC. You have a camera these days and you have a microphone. So pretty soon, people aren't going to be real sure whether that TV box that's sitting over there is just giving you entertainment or whether it's actually monitoring you and what's going on in your home. Automobile black box data. All the new automobiles have a black box in it, just like the aircraft on the, that they fly that gives all the telemetry about what the automobile is doing. Some of them have different amounts of time that, that, that falls in memory. Some are 10 minutes, some are you know, maybe perhaps longer. So anything that goes on in your car where the car gets in an accident, you don't get a hold of that black box because your insurance company confiscates it out of the car. In other words, if you get an accident and the car's taken to a junkyard, the, your insurance agent is over there taking that box and they plug it in and analyze it. Internet browsing records and Google searches. Think about that for a second. Everything that you ever asked into Google could be sitting on the NSA 
servers. Passport and travel databases. Every place that you've gone using a passport or, and of course the new passports are going to have the RFIDs in them, so then your, any place that you pass that's got a reader is going to read your passport at a distance. The whole idea of that is that when you're online to pass over a border, they're going to scan you three cars back, and by the time you come up to the, uh, the customs agent, he's going to have on his screen all your information. Everybody's in the car. Now, on this list, I just want to go back to the Art Bell show. I, I said, Art, okay, these are the things that I'm concerned about. And Art, and I said, is there, do you have a problem with the government just going ahead and having these things in a database somewhere? And Art Bell shockingly said to me, he said, no, I don't have a problem with it. He said, if you're not doing anything wrong, why would you worry about it? I couldn't believe it. You know, because I thought this man was something special in terms of all that he built. And, but, you know, it's, something happened. Something happened. I don't know what happened, but something, somehow something happened. The only thing out of that list that I just read that Art Bell had an objection to was have them having his DNA. Out of that long list. And, of course, the Founding Fathers put the Fourth Amendment in place because they feel the government shouldn't have any of your information unless there's a reasonable cause that you committed a crime. There is one client that I had, and I have to tell you this one quick story, there's a client that I had in the Los Angeles area, and he was interested in uh, Muslim uh, faith. He went down to a local library and he was looking up uh, Muslim information, in Al Jazeera and a bunch, a bunch of the other stuff. He was there and, you know, the people in the library saw what he was looking at. So somebody called the... Uh, Homeland Security. And on, on this particular day, two Homeland Securities in suits show up with a street police officer from the area. And they tell the librarian, we're going to take this guy out of here. So they get him. He's sitting there with his computer linked to the library system. They fold his computer up, close it, and they take him out to a white van in the parking lot. They seize him. In other words, he's seized. They put him in the, in the van, and a technician in the van downloads his hard drive. And the other two interview him, want to know, why are you looking at this information about Muslims in these countries? He said, I'm just doing research, you know, and I have interest in blah, blah, blah. So he said, where's, the, where's your warrant for taking my hard drive? He said, oh, we don't need a warrant. It's the Patriot Act. It's the Patriot Act. They copied his hard drive and told him, you're a naughty boy, don't look at this stuff anymore. And they, and they put, let him go back in the library with his PC. Makes me angry. Does it make you angry? Yeah. What is going on in America? <laughs> well, here's the other thing you need to know about the court system. I did want to make one more comment because I do law. This is the interesting thing that they did to us. You know, we originally had constitutional power, and when you went into courtrooms, the flag was the constitutional flag, which is the one without the fringe, because the fringe flag is the flag of the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief. But when you're in a military court, then the venue and the flag is a military flag. Now, you go anywhere in almost any public building in America, and they're flying military flags. What they did is they moved all law into contract law, so that Every, everything is based on offer and acceptance. You get offered a contract for a service or anything else, and you sign the contract, and then it's, it, you're bound contractually. Now, what they've tried to do is they want, to, they want to, you, for you to ex exchange your rights for privileges, driver's licenses. So what you do is you go in and you sign this one little form, but actually when you signed the form and, ba and made the contract with the state, you gave up your driving uh, unencumbered for now being involved with buying all the laws and regulations which in the book in California is about that thick. That's what you bought. It's called an adhesion contract. An adhesion contract means, you know, maybe one sheet saying, yeah, I want a driver's license, but the adhesion portion is that you bought the book. The whole book is now your responsibility to know relating to laws of the road and also penalties and everything else. So everything's in contract law now. And you may notice also that anytime anything comes to you with your name on it, it's all in capital letters. 
You know, a normal flesh and blood individual's name like mine would be capital R, lowercase o-g-e-r, uppercase t-o-l-c-e-s, because when you look in the U.S. Styles Manual, the U.S. Styles Manual tells you that flesh and blood people are stated in that manner in terms of the style. But when you receive these other offers and things, it's all in capital letters, which is character characteristic of a fictitious name entity. Now, on Sunday, when you look at your newspaper and you see that there's fictitious name filings, you'll see that if somebody's opening Joe's, uh, Joe's um, hot dog stand, they will have all capital letters. And so as a consequent, what they moved us to is the status of being a fictitious name entity. You're the surety for that trust. In other words, you're like the owner of Joe's hot dog stand. But any time you get involved with courts or anything like that, they're going to address you as that fictitious entity and therefore they can keep all of it in contract law and you can, can't go in the court and say, Your Honor, I want to invoke my constitutional rights. Well, you can't do that because you are a fictitious entity. You're Joe's hot dog stand. Joe's hot dog stand doesn't have any, uh, any rights like that. So I just wanted to be aware to watch out for contracts. You know, I, when I have contracts put in front of me and they say I sign under penalty of perjury, I scratch it right out. I scratch out under penalty of perjury. And you can say, I declare uh, that the, you know, when you scratch it out, that the, uh, the following is true and correct. But, you know, you've got a Fifth Amendment right not to get yourself into these jams. And knowing the Constitution will really help. Okay, since I have a shorter period of time here, we're going to move forward. Uh, I want to show you this. Uh, this is one of my favorite little signs. Can you see it? Can you see it? The brainwashed never wonder. Okay, there we go. Is that working better? We made this up, and I love it. The brainwashed never want they know. Now, the nice thing about a group like this is that you're not brainwashed. You're here for the truth. You want to know things. You are not the brainwashed. At least they haven't gotten to you yet. You're still here, and, you know, that's a feather in your cap. Your brain's still operating. You don't have the question mark. You're not, you're not with the sheeple. You're not going over the cliff with the rest of the sheeple. And hopefully uh, we co-influence one another to, to be able to continue forward and do some of the things we need to do to reclaim our nation. Okay, uh, this is a cartoon. You can't read it, but uh, this is an NSA one. I love this one. He says, we're tapping your phones, analyzing your call habits. It says the NSA on his little thing here. And compiling data on your personal information to keep the bad guys from taking away your freedoms. It's a, great, it's a great little cartoon. <clears throat> Here's a chart of what the NSA is up to. And this is on the Internet. And I can give you the, uh, the, the link on this. This shows that the, the NSA has run its tentacles through all our major communication centers. So in other words, all your ISP servers, all your phone lines, all your underground cable, all your satellite centers, are now run, tapped at those centers, fiber optics run back to the NSA headquarters. Now the reason that this is so so different than before, because before in, in, in the days when we were using telephone lines, when there was a wiretap order, that wiretap order was specific to a, a particular line. And an FBI technician or would go down to your local phone company if you were, the, if you were the, the object of the tap, and he'd hook across your lines. And they'd take your information, and that's how a wiretap was done. But not any longer. Because now they can not only tap your ISP in your email, but if you're on a voice over IP with a Magic Jack or anything else you want to use, I love Magic Jack, uh, you will then have yourself in what's known as packet format. And in the, in the Internet and all these new technologies, packets flow together just like fish floating in the stream. And at the other end, somewhere down the line, your packet gets separated. You know, packets are, are breakdowns of the individual moment, second to second. But yet we're all in the same stream. So when the NSA first started to attack and want to get wiretaps on individuals, they had to go in and tap the whole data stream with everybody else on there because it all flows together. So we can no longer be assured that a wiretap would tap only the person's line that was the target. 
and, and they used a machine called Carnivore. And what Carnivore originally was was a computer s a server that they would put inside one of these main distribution uh, locations. And it was in a metal cage. And they would run the ISP's main cable through the cage. And it was then looking at every email traveling during, uh, in that section of the country. So now we have to take the word from these people that they are not listening to anything other than they're supposed to. <laughs> NSA helped Microsoft make Vista secure. Aren't you assured on that? U.S. asked internet firms to save data could help fight child porn. Google, Microsoft, AOL, Comcast, Verizon, and others Friday in a private meeting with the Justice Department. So there you go. Three years of everything that you do on the Internet, right down into the supercomputers in the NSA. NSA has massive database of Americans' phone calls. Verizon, Bell South, QF, Quest. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. Well, this is why I really need to have these guys get me the right projector. But uh, this, you know, the main thing is that you get the drift, the drift of this, and of course, all the in-depth information about these events are still on the internet. Telecoms let NSA spy on calls, and then. When individuals sue these people, which has happened since then, because this article here is February 6, 2006, when American people say, hey, you know, you had no reason to listen to my phone calls. I'm suing you. The George Bush people say, we're going to give them immunity. Just totally sidestep the Fourth Amendment and sidestep the Constitution. Patriot Act. What's the Patriot Act? That makes it okay. You know. This is the really scary thing about where we're headed. Web users walk Great Firewall of China. And what happened was is, I'm going to have to kind of read it here as well, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, which have been pressured to help China's Internet snoops restrict access to certain content and finger those trying to evade restrictions. Watching on closed-circuit TV screens are linked to the nearby police station. Looking over the shoulders of everyone, they were talking about a cyber cafe that the people are in. The data collected through the use of software are instrument, inst instantly transferred to the police. This is 1984 high-tech. And you know something? These American companies, they just wanted the money. They went to China and said, yeah, you want to spy on the people, you want to lock them out? Give us the money and we'll show you how to do it. All these, you know, you're, you're right down the road from Silicon Valley here. And you know what's interesting? I went on the back streets of Silicon Valley the other day and a lot of these companies are empty. And you know, there is karma. I think everybody here understands karma. The amazing thing, though, is that, you know, countries have karma as well. And when Russell Means was here yesterday, you know, you think back on what the United States military did to rounding his people up in concentration camps. They gave them blankets with smallpox. Up in one of the areas where I, I have a home up there in Idaho, they put the Shoshone and Bannock, who hated one another, they were long-term warring tribes, they put them on the same reservation, hoping that they'd kill each other off. We genocided the South American people, the Vietnam people. We're working on uh, the Iraqi people. So karma is a big deal. And America, you know, may think it's going to go rolling on 200, 300 years, but you know something? Ain't going to happen. You can't go around genociding other human beings and expect that your life is going to be fine. It's not going to happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to jump over to electronic harassment, and this is where people take electronic weapons. Let me just read the definition. Electronic harassment happens if somebody uses any electronic device to aid themselves in invading your person or your property for the purpose of gathering information illegally or for the person, uh, purpose of causing harm. This is electronic harassment. This is the electronic harassment pages on my website, which you can go visit. It's, uh, uh, once again, it's uh, bugsweeps.com info electronic harassment, and there's a little box on the front page. One of the items that's on the front page, on the right, there is a modified microwave oven. So people say, well, you know, how can people get a hold of these energy weapons? You know, the government has all the energy weapons. Nobody has energy weapons. Well, guess what? If you have a 1,200-watt microwave oven in your home and you peel the side of the oven open, which I had a case where these people did that. They were got in a conflict with their neighbors. And what they did is they peeled the microwave open on the side, and then they went, and this is a diagram that you can see on the Internet, and they faced this weapon through the walls. And microwaves go right through the walls like they weren't there. So they radiated the next apartment and the next two apartments down. Each apartment, the people were getting sicker and sicker. And after I did this story, I talked about it on Coast to Coast, I had these people call me up and say, well, can you send me the plans? <laughs> oh, man, I tell you. You know, and it fries you what it does. And, and uh, first of all, my, let me just say something about microwave. Isn't it a little odd they say don't even operate the microwave or, or don't even stand near close to the microwave when it's operating because it's unhealthy? Well, here you got this uh, klystron tube that's in it, and what it does is it puts 2.4 gigahertz into the food, and it vibrates the molecules at this frequency. And so once the food comes out, it's secondary emission. The heat coming off the food is 2.4 gigahertz. And then you take this food and you throw it down your throat into your digestive tract. Number two cause of death in America. First is heart attack. What's the second one? Digestive tract cancer. 1980, when I did the research, and there's a doctor called Dr. Herzl that did the original research on it. Uh, the, uh, it was out of Sweden because that's where the original microwaves came from. And he did the research and he found it, it, was, it was terrible for rats. I mean, it was horrible for everything. The original microwave company was thinking he'd come up with a great report. He says, look at this, it's killing my rats. <laughs> and they said, oh, well, thank you for the report. That's all we need. We'll take the report now. But he ended up releasing the report and they put him in prison. The report's still around. And so what happens is microwave vibrates molecules in a whole different way than human beings have been eating food for the billions of years we've heated over a fire. It's a whole different dynamic. And when I read all the information myself back in 1980, I lifted my microwave up and threw it in the dumpster. And I had to, and now I have to go to these uh, places like Denny's if I'm on the road. I said, well, do you microwave the food? And they'll say, oh, yeah. Well, I said, well, I don't want my food microwaved. You don't? Vegetables. Normally it's the vegetables, not the mains, not the meat mains. It's the vegetables. So ask if you go to a restaurant whether they're microwaving your food and don't eat it. It's radiation, basically radiation. Jumping over to radiation, uh, on the my website, once again, here is a picture of active denial. This is the military's microwave weapon. And what it does is it fries people. It's a 95 gigahertz, 1 million watt thing on a truck, and you, you just go and you, you aim it at people and you burn them. And it, it, there's a video also, there's a demonstration video on YouTube. If you, if you put in active denial, you will see the video. And uh, the video will uh, give you, they actually showed the machine and they had a reporter that was brave, brave enough to stand out there, and he got radiated and had to hit the ground in about two seconds because they were toasting them. Now, here's the other problem, microwave towers. Okay, here's the little part of my website where you click on this tower and it will show you how they're concealing microwave towers these days. That is this document. They've got them in church steeples, flagpoles, utility poles, flagpole, uh, 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 a Christian cross for a, uh, a uh, church. Uh, they've got them in phony, phony buildings. They've got them in, uh, let me pull up. They've got them in uh, uh, different kinds of chimneys, uh, different kinds of enclosures. Here's a water tower. Here's a clock. 
So, uh, trees as well. Yeah, they, the phony trees. So anyway, here here's what you've got: a microwave tower can have up to three separate transmitting systems. Here's a picture of a typical tower. This one only has one level, but when you get into the city here, you'll see three levels. Now, here's an interesting thing. They have synthesizers. There are channels that these things operate under. And they operate in clusters like this. We have this three cluster right here. This is a small three-section microwave system. But guess how many channels each tower can synthesize? You're going to love this. 666 channels. That's one tower level. And some of these have three or four because there's an AT&T and there's all that. So what they further look like, you start expanding it out, you start to get a matrix. This is the matrix. And what this is about is not just about communication. This is about what's going to happen when they decide to take over the streets of America. If there's a Rodney King event or some kind of event where they want to bring the people to their knees, they will take the synthesizers in here and they will start, they will turn off the cell and they will synthesize the kind of waveforms that we were hit with here yesterday. And all of a sudden you're going to be sick, you're going to feel terrible, you're going to have headaches, you won't be able to think straight, and that is what we're up against. Depends on how much power they, they, they turn it up. But it's not a matter of range anymore because you see with a matrix like this, they're never more than a mile or two from the next one. So you can saturate a large area. Let me show you the next. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the one that shows the 666 channels. Each one has the ability to generate on a synthesized basis. Here's another diagram that shows, it almost looks like a beehive, but you're, you're living in there. And you know, I have people where I, where I go to where they're located, and these hidden, you know, they, they, don't, they don't understand why they're sick. And then we turn on this machine that I've got, and we see that they are, there's a tower sitting right within 100 feet sometimes. And they're being just fried slowly. They always feel worse during rush hour. You know, people will be 5 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock in the morning when the tower power comes up. The more people that are on the tower on the phone requests, more power from the tower. You've got uplink and downlink and control channel for every call. So if, you have a, if you're near a freeway where people are calling, and I've had several people that got very sick, and they would get sick 5 in the morning. They wake up 5 in the morning, their heart was racing. And uh, by 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, uh, you know, they would peak with feeling bad. 10 o'clock, they feel better. They're okay 10 in the afternoon to about 4 in the afternoon when the cell traffic comes back up. Everybody jumps in their cars and gets on the cell phone. So when you really expand it out, that's what it looks like. You're covering probably 10 square miles. And there you are. The mind control system is in place. They just need to throw the switches, just like the NSA. You know, when the NSA put the CLIA bill through, the, uh, the, law, the law that required everybody's phone to be pre-wiretapped in America, which was years ago, they added on your phone bill so that they, your phone goes to the NSA or to FBI. All they have to do is sit at their computer and, and punch in on the keyboard your phone number and bang, all your calls go into the hard drive. This is going to be very similar. They just say, these sectors of the city are causing problems. Let's let them have it. But it's gotten more refined than that. I have information that now, with a sample of your DNA, they can direct specific waves to specific people. So if you're a dissident in a particular area, they'll say, well, where is this person? Check his cell phone. Towers will ping the cell phone always over here. Okay, I'm going to sit at my uh, control unit here and I'm going to, we've got his DNA, let's, uh, let's give him a head cold for the next couple of days. Let's give him a virus. Let's take him out. 
he's going to be a problem for the next couple of days. Let's just broadcast an energy waveform that will have a bio effect such that that individual, even though other people are being radiated with the same thing, there's a bioresonance to every individual, just like our fingerprint. Every person has an individual DNA, a different bioresonance. And so uh, the Stockland, the original Stockland patent is on my website where Stockland was able to go voice the skull with pulse tra uh, transmissions in 92. And then after the, the rest of the development went black ops. We don't really know what happened after that. We knew we could put voices in into, uh, to, uh, group people's heads. What they did, and I know from the Russian trans translation, from Cheryl Welch, from reading all her translated psychotronic stuff from Russia, that they figured out how to biocode these microwaves so that it can attack specific individuals. Or you can do races. Let's say you go to Arabia. You want to just radiate and send these negative energies to Arabic people. You code it so that the Arabic DNA is the only recipient of, the, of this negative stuff and that all the Caucasian people don't get it. It's pretty far out. Here is a YouTube presentation that is excellent. It's called Hidden Towers, Radio Frequency, and Mind Control. It's a great little movie. I won't take the time because I'm running out of time here to tell you what it's about. Go watch it. Microchip implants. We have equipment that detects microchip implants, and from the people I scan, about 15% have them. They do all kinds of different things. Some are just tracking chips where they want to know where you're going. Some are biotelemetry, which send out telemetry. Some are in the other direction where you can send and cause people to have certain things happen to them. Uh, most of it was done for identification. I think for the most part, now that they've got the directed energy weapon systems figured out, that they're going to stop doing the chips because it's just too big a deal to try to chip everybody. But if you can have their uh, DNA and you can address each individual person on a DNA basis from these towers, from the matrix, you got it made. You got what you need. These are a couple other uh, harassment weapons. These are uh, lasers because I have people that get different kind of laser attacks that people still do use lasers to attack other individuals. <clears throat> this is the picture of the Iridium satellite. Now, with the, This is a, a group of satellites that are geostationary that cover the planet. The next diagram is the planetary coverage. I know it's rather small for you to see, but there isn't a square inch of the world that isn't covered by these satellites. There's a, a total of uh, 70, I know they lost one because they crashed one into or some, uh, somebody crashed one of them, but I think there's 76 total satellites. This was a private phone system until the United States Defense Department took it over. Iridium went out of business, so the Defense Department took it over. But it covers every piece of the planet. So our little attack visit yesterday might have been from an Iridium satellite. One of the things that I also have uh, on the website here is the law that allows the government to do bioweapons experiments on the citizens. Title 50, Chapter 13, uh, Chapter uh, let me see. Title 50, Chapter 32, Section 1520 was the original. 1520 said that the Defense Department and their uh, different uh, subcontractors could do bioweapons experiments on any civilian population with 30 days' notice to anybody in authority. How does that make you feel? And this was 1996. I went to Barbara Boxer when somebody pointed this out to me. I actually met with her. I said, why would you people who are supposed to have our welfare as your interest to carry out, would you ever have the Defense Department put a law on it that would turn us into guinea pigs? She said, well, I don't know. I didn't even know there was this law. So I said, okay. She said, I'll find out. So she writes to the Department of Defense. I've got the letter. Department of Defense comes back and says, oh, we don't do that. We don't do that. But then, about six months later, I'm, I look at it up again, and it says it's been repealed. I said, look at that. We did something. We got it repealed. Next defense uh, appropriations bill, they put on 1520A. Now, 1520A says, basically, that you, can't, uh, you have to get permission from everybody that you would want to do a bioweapons experiment on, with the exception of any law enforcement purpose.
What's that? Well, that's a different one. That's a different one. So anyway, the original non-lethal weapons was under the control of the Department of Defense. The next thing we know, lethal weapons development now goes over under the control of the Attorney General. So now, law enforcement purpose, Attorney General, that's what they're up to. DARPA. Defense Advanced Projects Agency. I love their I love their little front cover. It's got a picture of everybody standing there. They're just folks like us, you know. Only problem is, is that they're installing brain gates in people. This is another uh, piece of information that's on my website, and this one has to do with this little experiment they did on a young man who was a paraplegic. There's a picture of the. Microchip, they drill, he was a crippled individual, he had a car accident. They drill a hole in his head, they put this interface chip in, and next thing you know, he's playing Pong with his mind. You know, the old Pong game with the pucks and the ball going back and forth. This shows a close-up of one of the actual pins that went down out of this 100-pin interface. And here's a picture of him. They originally were just doing sketches of him. Here's him playing Pong. This is the interface cable going straight through his skull. And uh, you know the guy's name, yeah, because later on here there was an actual picture of him, which I'm going to pull up, because they did release. Uh, here's the scientist that invented it. These are all in universities, by the way. You know, a lot of the DARPA research on this stuff is in individual universities. And. There's a diagram also of how the little the, the brain tap goes. So where this is going is that soon they're going to want to install a brain interface chip so that you can directly interface with computers. And the way they're going to sell this one to all the kids is, you know, now you're out of college, you've got a PhD, but the problem is is that the kid over here only got in high school, he's got the brain interface. So he can think 500 times faster than you can. Because he just plugs himself into a computer and has the computer assist him on anything that he needs to know or do. He can calculate and think lightning, lightning speed beyond yourself. So if you don't get a chip like this, you're not going to be competitive. And that's how they're going to do it. They're going to say you, the operation is going to be optional, but you know, you're going to be a dunce compared to somebody that's got this brain power. There is a, a picture on the internet of the young man. That is the fellow that uh, that did get the brain interface, and he, he he was very pleased with it because he was unable to move his body, and that's a that's a good thing, you know. I mean, anytime you can use medical stuff to help people, this is Los Alamos research. This is a brain scanning machine. Your head goes in this piece right here, and what the machine is going to do is it's going to read your mind. This is the new lie detector. Pretty scary, like just out of 1984. You put this thing on your head. There's some other pictures. This is what it looks like on their TV screen. When you're, and they're able to tell what the activity is. So if you are an individual and they put something in front of you and it stimulates a part of the brain that means you're a criminal, then you're in trouble. It's the brain police, thought police. It really is, this is the instrument of the thought police. Here's an, uh, a close-up view, and this is all right, right on the uh, Los, Al Los, Los Alamos website. Okay, here we go. They gotta get me this, they gotta get me this projection unit next time, I because really, I really would like you to see the details on this though. Anyway, that's it. The other, uh, the other thing is that you, you guys, you should be able to know what this is just by looking at it. What's that? MRI. Okay, let's read what the headline says on this particular story. MRI lie detection to get first day in court. Here is a guy that's gone to a company called No Lie MRI out of San Diego because he said that he didn't do it. So to prove that he didn't do it, he went and took the No Lie MRI and they ended up scanning his brain and deciding that he was not 
responsible for a crime. In India? Yeah. YouTube, 60 Minutes did a whole section on that. So you can pull up YouTube and look at, read your mind. January 4th of 09, a brain imaging story, 13 minutes on YouTube. I'm kind of flashing through these here. Uh, the trans, one of the interesting things is transcranial magnetic stimulation. They're now going to solve everybody's mental problems by putting electric currents through your head. It kind of sounds like the old uh, shock treatment, doesn't it? But this is much more sophisticated. They're putting specific kind of energies through your brain to neutralize different kinds of thoughts and problems. And I'm sure the behavioral scientists will say it's going to correct whatever difficulties they think you have. Homeland Security detects terrorist threats by reading your mind. Body, t uh, it has a, this is a thing called mal, mal intent, and this is a actual mobile uh, screening system with ramps, and they're going to run all kinds of people through it that go to events and go to aircraft and all that. It says it has a series of sensors and imagers that read your body temperature, heart rate, and respiration for unconscious tells invisible to the naked eye signals terrorists and criminals that, may, that they may display in advance of an attack. This is a mobile screening, a screening laboratory. And there is an actual video presentation with this that's about 15 minutes that shows how it works. It really is surprising that they wanted to show it to us, but it is really something else. Okay, here on the private sector comes the Imitov system. This is a brain wave helmet that you will wear first applications to play games with. But where it's going is, is that you'll put this thing inside a hat and you'll wear it as you walk around and then computers that, are in, that will be embedded in the environment will communicate with it. And this thing will not only read your thoughts, but it will also put video information into your, eye, into your eye circuits so that you'll actually see just like the cyborgs did in the uh, Terminator series, you know, he would see the data in his eyeball, him, what he was viewing. This is going to do the same thing. So that when you go, say, to an airport, airport will know who you are the minute you walk into proximity of the readers. It will then give you your flight information in your eyeball. You'll then do something to confirm that you're there and present. It will give you other information that you need. So this whole idea is, to, is that the environment will become part of the overall brain s structure and that we will then be totally connected no matter where we go. Uh, okay. Here's the next one. This one is new instruments of surveillance and social control, wireless technologies which target target the neural function of the brain. They kind of call it a psycho-civilized society. Psycho-civilized. Computers embedded in the environment. Human body is going to be rewired into a biological antenna. So in other words, they're going to take your bioenergy and they're going to tune it so that you start to be directly connected with this network. Yeah. Biochip gateway implanted into the brain. It's on the way. Here is a home type of brainwave system that you can get right now. Neural stimulation using moving magnetic signals. The coil shatai is for spiritual personality transformation, overcoming fear, sadness, and anger. Running through quickly some of the bioweapons. Here's a kit, high voltage bio. Uh, get this is a blaster where you electromagnetic electromagnetic blaster similar to microwave oven so you can do that here's another kit company microwave gun so these things are around if you want to you can join the directed energy weapons 2009 this is a conference they had for all the weapon builders here is a gun which is a gun by Raytheon. You know, Raytheon, the same people that made the original microwaves, are now making the weapons. Here's a guy 
at the Raytheon table at a weapons convention, turning on the gun and blasting himself. I guess he had to convince himself it was painful because he looks like he's getting a lot of pain. This is a small version instead of a version that's the size of a truck. So this one here will work on a more localized basis. You can put it in your neighbor's house and attack. Am I out of time? 30 seconds. I would have loved to have you had some questions and question and answer. I know you're raising your hand. I don't, you may have to talk to me outside because I've got 30 seconds. So at any rate, hopefully I've given you some insight. You know, when I prepared this, it, it was depressing. It was depressing to me because we're not going in the right direction. We're building all this further destruction stuff. So we've got to do something. I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, sending your money to Washington is probably not a good idea. That's basically the way, the way I handle it. Anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.